what is the, the process like? Is it, do some people make progress very quickly? Do some people um, experience kind of step functions towards progress? Uh, what does the meditation practice look like over time? Mm. Uh, do you still meditate or do you, have you just threaded it through your jujitsu, your writing, your daily life, your coffee, your time with your wife, mm. et cetera? Yeah. Also, just to come back to, just to, to talk about the myth for a second. So they're, they're really, what you just enunciated was a, a kind of a second doorway into this whole project. So like the, the usual door is through the door of suffering, for lack of a better word. I mean, people feel unhappy in a variety of ways and they get more sensitized to the mechanics of their own unhappiness. And meditation is one of the things on the menu that's, that is, is explicitly built as a remedy for, for unhappiness. And uh, and it is, and that's, you know, I, I think that's probably the most common path to this. But another path is just intellectual interest. I mean, just wanting to know what's real so about the mind subjectively you know, in, a, in a first person way. And, and there's, there's no contradiction between those two things. I'm, I'm motivated by both of them. But, um, you yeah, know, it's a totally valid doorway into this. Um, there are definitely step functions. I mean, I would say there, there are at least two. I mean, the, the, and it, they really are articulated along the lines of, of um, the framework I've been describing of, of, of dualistic and non-dualistic mindfulness, right? So in the beginning, you're going to start out, you know, 99.9% .9 of people will start out dualistically paying attention and, and noticing the difference between being distracted by thought and then being on the object of attention, whether it's the breath or sounds or whatever. And eventually that, you know, that opens up to all possible objects of attention, including thoughts. And, the, and the, there's still this fluctuation between being distracted and then being a mindful of whatever. And the fact that it's open to all possible objects differentiates this type of practice from anything that is narrowly focused on one object, like a mantra or a visualization or society. You know, those are other paths of practice that are more concentration-based um, and interesting. But the, the benefit of mindfulness is that very quickly you realize it's by definition compatible with all possible experience because you're not artificially contracting your attention down to something. You're, ju you're just being aware of the next thing, a sight, a sound, a taste, a thought. Um, so the first step function is to very clearly experience the difference between being lost in thought and being clearly aware of any part of experience, including thought, and to notice the freedom, the comparative psychological freedom that gives you, right? So you can like, you're, something's made you angry and now you're thinking about all the reasons why you should be angry and have every right to be angry and what you're gonna tell that person when you see them. And, and then you notice your thinking, right? And you notice the connection between the thought and the anger, right? You like like the, the, the minute spent lost in thought about what's making you angry is the thing that dragged through the physiology of anger, right? And the moment you notice that once you're mindful, once you can be mindful, you can notice thought as thought and how quickly that dissipates. That's just the language and the imagery, it just you, you couldn't hold on to it if you wanted to. And then you notice the physiology of the anger is just this kind of meaningless, uh, you know, kind of inner incandescence that has its own half-life and degrades very, very quickly when you're no longer thinking about the reasons why you should be angry. You can't hold on to the anger. The anger itself dissipates, right? And from, some, from the point of view of the one who's being mindful, this is tremendous relief. I mean, and at minimum, it's a degree of freedom. You can, at that point, decide, well, how long do I want to be angry for, right? Is it useful to stay angry? Do I want to be angry for one minute, two minutes, five minutes, 10 minutes, or... Because before you have that capacity to be mindful, you're going to helplessly be as angry as you're going to be for as long as you're going to be that way, just based on the kind of the, the time course of your thinking about it, brooding about it, telling your wife about it. You know, like it just the, the you know, it's just going to be this conversation-based misadventure in you know negative uh, states of mind, uh, and you are you are going to be the hostage of that for as long as you'll be the hostage of that. You'll have nothing you can do apart from just deciding to, you know, check out and watch Game of Thrones again for the third time, right? Like like it's just you can divert your attention to something else, which is you know sometimes a good thing to do. But mindfulness 
even dualistic mindfulness gives you this capacity to just observe the mechanics of this and then get off the ride when you, when you, whenever you want. So that really is a step function. Like first there was a time when, you, there was a time before you could do that and then there's a time after which you can do that. The other step function is noticing that there is no one who is doing that. I mean, this is the non-duality, the, the selflessness, the, the centerlessness of awareness, right? The fact that there's no place from which the mindfulness is being aimed, but the fact that there's just this open condition in which everything is appearing, you know, thoughts included. To, to have you, as at that point, your mindfulness no longer becomes, it's no longer this, this dualistic effort to strategically pay attention to anything as opposed to being lost in thought. It's just what's left when thoughts, when, when, when the present recognized thought unravels, even before it unravels, what's recognized is you are simply identical to the condition in which everything is appearing. Now, again, this is not a, I'm not making a, a, a Deepak Chopra-like metaphysical claim about the mind. You know, this is not, I'm not saying the mind isn't what the brain is doing. I'm not saying that you're recognizing the consciousness that gave birth to the universe. I'm not, not, not making any broad claims about metaphysics. I'm just talking about as a matter of experience, there is just this condition in which everything is appearing, right? And what you're calling your body, again, as a matter of experience, I'm not saying that we can't have third-person conversations about you know, physical bodies in the physical world. But as a matter of experience, the only body you're ever going to directly encounter as your own is an appearance in consciousness, right? So consciousness is not in your body. What you're calling your body is in consciousness. You know, visually, proprioceptively, it's like everything is just appearing in this condition. And Again, you're not aiming, you're not, this is not a spotlight that you're aiming at the body or at, you know, it, there's just this condition in which everything, including anything you could call yourself, is appearing. And um, so, yeah, so that's the second step function is to recognize that this is, all, this is already true. Consciousness is already without this thing you've been calling your ego, hoping, and, uh, you know, hoping to, to unravel it through meditation. Consciousness is not going to get any more selfless, any more centerless, any freer than it all, always already is recognized as such. And, and so that's, that's the, the, that the step function at that point is your mindfulness at that point, the thing you come back to when you're no longer distracted is that, that recognition again and again. And then it becomes, yeah, it becomes compatible with anything you would do. And so to answer your question, yes, I, I still practice, you know, formally, you know, sometimes, you know, frequently, but not, you know, I definitely miss days and I don't do it for, I mean, I, you know, I, I don't rule out the, the possibility that I will go back on retreat at various times just to you know, check in with that and see if, if that makes a difference. But, um, you know, I, t you know, I tend to sit for, um, I mean, I tend to, I've, I've designed my life so that I can spend a lot of time meditating without having to be formally meditating. Like, so, you know, I'll, you know, I'll go for a hike for two hours, right? And what I'm doing when I'm hiking is identical to what I'm doing when I'm, quote, meditating, you know, sitting in a chair, you know, doing nothing but meditate. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I mean, I just, again, the, uh, I'm very, um, I'm very interested in erasing the boundary between what people are calling meditation and, and the rest of life. And that, so that in, in, in teaching these things, I tend to emphasize that from the beginning because I, I think it's, it's very easy to set up, um, to, 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 get, to get gulled by a bunch of assumptions that, ca that cause you to be very um, split in your sense of what your life is about. And like I'm, I'm sort of banking my meditation over here because I'm, I'm meditating two hours a day diligently and you know, this is going to be really good for me. And then over here, this is the rest of my life, which is not nearly as wise or as useful or as like, this is the stuff that is still the area of my problems. And um, I think it's useful to recognize you've got one, you've got one life, you know, and you've got this, 
this, this single condition of consciousness and its contents in every mode of life. And there's something to recognize about it. And you're always free to recognize that. And you, you, truly, even in your dreams, right? I mean, it's just not, it's, it never stops. So that's, that's what I tend to emphasize.